Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa, no mai haere mai. Hello everyone and welcome to the session on how New Zealand can be a global leader in sustainable space and aerospace. In the next 60 minutes you will hear a discussion on New Zealand's potential to be at the forefront of sustainable space and aerospace activities. My name is Kelly Lee Dam and I'm the Head of Communications and Engagement at the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. We will open with a karakia. Whakataka tiho ki te uru, whakataka tiho ki te tonga, ki a kina kina ki ota, ki a tara tara ki tai, e he akiana te atakura he teo, he huka he hauhunga, haumia huia taikia. The Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a community of more than 500 entrepreneurs and investors and innovators committed to New Zealand as a base camp for global impact. Our purpose is to partner with Aotearoa to find and build solutions to our toughest challenges. Our vision is that Aotearoa inspires global leadership and solutions for future generations, built on principles of tangata tiriti and values of Sir Edmund Hillary. EHF Fellows are creating impact in a wide range of areas. In the past seven years, we estimate that every dollar of public investment has created $111 of potential direct economic impact. In 2023, Fellows directly invested more than $114 million into New Zealand-based businesses. They connected Kiwi businesses to more than $312 million in capital, created over 100 new businesses, and paid upwards of $45.5 million in New Zealand salary payments. Fellows are tackling systems change from education to environment and working with local communities on the ground, giving their time and talent. And we have a number of fellows leading groundbreaking work in space and aerospace. This is a sector that has the potential to drive huge economic, environmental and social impact for Aotearoa. Aerospace and space is also an area where New Zealand could lead the way in terms of sustainable solutions and applications. And that is the focus of today's session. First, I want to acknowledge the sad and recent loss of Rod Oram, who was part of Kawakawa, the first cohort of fellows who had such a profound impact on this fellowship. Rod was a committed, credible, and passionate voice for climate change. We are so honored to have had Rod as a fellow and as a friend. He will be fondly remembered and greatly missed. I also just want to note apologies from Rosalie Nelson, our CEO of the Edmund Hillary um, Fellowship and Hillary Institute. She's unable to join us today, but is looking forward to seeing what comes out of this discussion. Okay, so just a few housekeeping notes uh, before I hand over. Um, if you could just please keep your audio off unless you're speaking. Um, we would encourage you to have your video on because we'd love to see your faces and see who we're talking with. Um, if you could just ensure your Zoom name is your full name and your own name and not a work uh, address or another person. Um, we are recording this session to make it available afterwards um, and we're only gonna be capturing the speakers in the recording. Uh, if you've got any thoughts or questions, please use the chat box and we'll pick these up either during or at the end of the session. Um, if you are asking a question, if you could just put question in front of it so it's really clear that you're looking for a response. Um, this session includes a group of panellists and each panellist will have a few minutes to share their stories and insights and our moderator will ask questions and then we'll open up for questions towards the end. So I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our moderator for today's session, Mark Rocket. Mark was the seed investor and co-director of Rocket Lab from 2007 to 2011. Mark is the CEO of Kia Aerospace, a company that is building solar powered aircraft that will continuously fly for months in the stratosphere. He's the president of Aerospace New Zealand, which is an industry led body working to grow the aerospace sector. It's an absolute pleasure to have Mark moderating this session. And Mark, welcome, and I will hand over to you. Thank you, Kelly, and the AHF team. Great to be here today. Uh, yeah, we've got some really uh, interesting topics to discuss and some great panellists, so uh, this, this should be fun. Uh, I'll kick off just giving a few general thoughts. Uh, firstly, space versus aerospace. And yeah, I think you know it's, it's quite an interesting scenario. Space certainly has that cachet. Uh, people are quite intrigued by it, uh, but the reality is we, we've only got a, a, a small number of space companies, uh, and some of them are doing extremely well and doing fantastic things, uh, and hopefully that will continue to grow. 
but the other side of it is is the advanced aviation, the aero and the aerospace. Uh, and the reality is New Zealand has a, a long pedigree of work in aviation going right back to Richard Pierce, uh, to the Air Force, uh, to commercial work that's going on. And we've, we've got many dozens of advanced aviation companies now in New Zealand doing really innovative work. And I see, you know, that's where a lot of the jobs are going to be. And a lot of the job growth is going to be in the shorter term. And then hopefully we'll move more into the space economy side of things and, and develop more space companies. And yeah, I think space kind of has that sizzle. You know, we've got a minister for space. Uh, I did try and say maybe it should have been a minister for aerospace, but you know, again, space has that kind of cachet in it and sort of grabs the headlines, grabs the attention. Uh, but I think, you know, the majority of the work going on in aerospace is actually in that advanced aviation area where you've got so many people doing work in um, yeah, UAVs, drones, uh, autonomous flight systems, uh, yeah, all, all sorts of really interesting projects going on all, all around New Zealand. Uh, so yeah, I, I see see that they they line up really well if we, if we can sort of combine the power of this advanced aviation and the space sector and and grow uh, that 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 whole aerospace story, and that sort of leads me on to my second point about sort of talking about the narrative. You know, I, I think a lot of aerospace companies they really need to work on on making sure that we bring people along with us on the journey in New Zealand and also offshore. So it's something that we could do a little bit better on as an, an industry. And it's something that came out of the summit. Uh, some of the discussions of the New Zealand Aerospace Summit last year was that we kind of need to work together to make sure that people know of the of the really cool, innovative stuff that's going on. And yeah, and, and, and just really telling more people about it. You know, 20, 30 years ago, many people in New Zealand, New Zealand wouldn't have predicted where we are now, where we've got uh, re really leading industries and in, in the winemaking industry, boat building, filmmaking, you know, they've come such a long way. You know, I'd really love to see aerospace be one of our leading industries in the next 10, 20 years. I think we've got some really huge opportunities there. And lastly, I'll just sort of touch on sustainability, uh, which I think is, is a really interesting one. Obviously, it's, it's a buzzword at the moment. You know, wh what does sustainability really mean uh, in, in 2024? Uh, so I think we'll, we'll have some really great discussions from the panelists uh, around that. The reality is in space and aerospace around the world, a lot of the activity is actually really tied heavily to the, to military uh, applications. Uh, you, you look at uh, you know, Russia, America, China, uh, a lot of those countries have, have really strong military industrial complexes, which are really at the heart of a lot of their space and aerospace development. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, we have a small air force uh, with uh, much limited capability, and we're not really putting a lot of those research dollars uh, into the space and aerospace industries uh, that those other countries are. And, you know, significantly, a lot of that is not military. So, you know, I think that's that's an interesting opportunity for New Zealand where we could take a more of a commercial focus. And if you look at Rocket Lab as an example, you know, we're the 11th country in the world to be orbital capable, but we're the only country that did that purely from a commercial foundation. You know, all those other countries uh, had that military and industrial complex that uh, propelled them forward. Whereas, you know, New Zealand, we got the investment uh, to develop that orbital campaign. So I think that that provides a really interesting model uh, for New Zealand and a whole range of different niches. So yeah, that's that's just a, a quick opening from, from me, but I'd really love to pass it over now to, to Emmeline, who is the co-founder and CEO of Space Space, a social enterprise for space for everyone, starting with New Zealand. She is the co-founder of International Space Consultants. She's held senior positions at Singularity University and is part of the series Robotics Team. Uh, Emmeline is an Edmund Hillary Fellow and last year was named world-class friends of New Zealand at the Kia Global Awards with her husband, Eric. Uh, yeah, I'll pass it over to you, Emmeline. Uh, maybe you can start by sharing your experiences around New Zealand aerospace or space industry and yeah, how you'd describe the industry's potential. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for that introduction. Uh, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Um, morena, everybody. Uh, and again, thank you to EHF for giving me the opportunity kind of to, to do this. So um, my remarks right now are 
for, for this particular uh, session is really all about the background. And because I do work more on the space side of things, um, I wanna give a little bit of a background of what the global space industry opportunity is. And then also what the state of the New Zealand space industry uh, as we go into the kind of the discussions of why uh, sustainable space is something that is a brand that New Zealand could actually own uh, to the rest of the world and, and be kind of like a, a, an actually an industry leader. So let me just like share um, a like two slides here. So just to to point out that the global space economy right now is is basically half a trillion dollars. Um, there's a lot of sub, kind of like misnomer about why uh, in the uh, in the global sense it's normally more government than commercial, but that's really not the case anymore. As you can see here, it's actually eighty twenty, meaning that eighty percent is is now commercial. Um, and then the, the possibilities of it uh, from Peter Beck's uh, quote last night is like 2.3 trillion uh, global opportunity kind of today. One thing that I also wanted to really point out here is that uh, you know we're always fascinated with rockets and launches, but that's actually a very small uh, part of the global space economy. The, the big part of this uh, half a trillion is really on the application side. And so just to think about it, it's like data is king, uh, but there is a lot of um, uh, opportunities in the manufacturing side. So moving over to the New Zealand kind of like ecosystem. So you need all of the players to actually create an ecosystem. And so I just wanted to point out where we are today. So we have a progressive government uh, in the form of the New Zealand Space Agency, which does the, the regulations and the policies. Uh, we have launch facilities and infrastructure, especially because of Rocket Lab. We now have um, at Mahia, there's like two launch pads. Uh, there's a um, now a, a center for uh, uh, testing uh, as well in Auckland. Um, and then now Tafaki uh, down in the South Island is also big, uh, has a potential for being either a, a spaceport or, or an aviation test facility. There's ground stations in the south and the north, um, and then like radar stations for, for LEU labs, um, and then testing facilities also in Auckland. Uh, on the education side, there's now um, all of the uh, kind of the, the major universities are uh, offering like courses and 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 also degrees either in aerospace engineering or or also uh, hybrids of like space sciences under the on um, the graduate level and then also on the undergraduate level uh, on the industry collaboration side there are two official industry uh, associations so there's the New Zealand Aerospace and there's the also Auckland Aerospace um, and then in terms of like funding sources uh, as well they're all over the 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 country uh, it used to be that traditional investing uh, was not there but like about two years ago we uh, like seeing now the interest in um, venture capitalists to actually invest in in the industry and I was just in this like really great uh, event yesterday uh, at the parliament and it's just I was wowed by some of the the like the statistics that uh, came out from Rocket Lab and by de facto, of course, uh, New Zealand. So I just wanted to kind of uh, rattle this off just for people to, if you don't uh, know, we're the fourth in the world for the highest number of launches per year, only behind US, China, and Russia. Uh, second most frequently launched rocket, uh, only behind SpaceX. Uh, there's about 1,700 spacecrafts with parts from Rocket Lab uh, out there. And if you, it, for context, there's about 9,000 operational satellites in orbit. Uh, greater than 30% of spacecraft went up last year with the Rocket Lab logo. Um, the first mission on to the moon under the new NASA Artemis program, which was Capstone, was actually launched from New Zealand. Um, we will potentially land on the moon under the NASA CLIPS program uh, this year, crossing fingers um, with Rocket Lab um, the components and parts. Uh, working on a mission to Mars launching this year as well, um, working on a large rocket neutron to com to compete with SpaceX Falcon 9 that can lift like about 13 tons to orbit. And um, like lastly, world's first space manufacturing mission completed to produce pharmaceutical drugs in space and successfully land back on Earth. Uh, that was the Varda mission um, as well through Rocket Lab. And uh, one last uh, statistic. 
from uh, Peter Beck last night was there's 1,700 Rocket Lab suppliers in New Zealand, which I think that that this just shows like the immense work that has been done over the past like uh, half a decade or so in New Zealand. And there's just lots of, of opportunities that's going to happen. So I think I will uh, end there. Excellent. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, yeah, I'll now pass it over to Max, who is the founder and CEO of Zeno Astronautics, a US and New Zealand based company pioneering superconducting magnets for space applications. Max studied biomedical engineering and engineering science at the University of Auckland, where Zeno was born. Uh, today, Zeno's space magnets ensure satellite missions are effectively managed uh, through fuel free precise positioning. Max, uh, can you share some of your experiences with the New Zealand space industry and how you've described the industry's potential? Thank you very much, Mark. Well, I'm not nearly as well prepared as Emmeline. It was great to see the slide and all the information. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, as you said, Zen is in the business of, uh, you know, electrifying space. Sometimes I give a very rough analogy for people who are not in the industry. I say that we're building electric vehicles for space applications, just like we have electric vehicles on Earth, you know, a Tesla car, let's say. We do a similar sort of thing, but for space. So we're eliminating fuel, eliminating complex moving parts. And the primary idea there is that we realize that if we are to explore space, you know, for a, a meaningful amount of time, you know, decades and centuries, if we have to, we must do it sustainably, you know, uh, those of us who are in the industry, we are aware that if we don't do it sustainably, there'll be a quick end to it, you know, uh, because of the pollution of the orbit and so on. So we must uh, find a way to do it responsibly. Uh, and uh, I think ensuring that we're not um, attached to Earth by this umbilical cord for, you know, uh, constant reliance on Earth for resupply of fuel, resupply of, you know, spacecraft that continuously re-enter and so on, that'll be a lot better for, you know, um, for the future of aerospace. Yeah, and so uh, my experience uh, with uh, within New Zealand in particular, I mean, we have a very small industry. Uh, we have a, as Emmeline said, we have a giant uh, in the, you know, in the country, which is Rocket Lab. And uh, we have... Um, you know, another uh, handful of companies that, you know, that come to mind, like Don Aerospace, Kia Aerospace, and a few, you know, smaller companies that are not yet active on the market. Uh, but yeah, I mean, New Zealand's a handful, handful of companies. Um, I, th I think most of us, most, most of the New Zealand businesses do business overseas. We don't really do any business in New Zealand when it comes to aerospace. Um, uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, as, as far as the perception goes from 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 the outside of the world, you know, from overseas, uh, you know, Rocket Lab. I'm just back from a, from a um, satellite 2024, a huge con a few a huge conference uh, held in the Washington D.C. and uh, Rocket Lab was mentioned a few times as a small up and coming player. So that just gives you a perspective. You know, <laughs> we see it as a huge giant in New Zealand. You know, but they say we need to su support small up and coming players like Rocket Lab. You know, so everyone everyone else with a profile that is lower than Rocket Lab is not even mentioned ever. You know, pretty much in the states. <laughs> It's just a small company doing a bit of business. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Max. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when I come back on the plane to New Zealand from overseas, I have that sort of same feeling like, uh, yeah, we're, we're just such a, a small fish in a, in a big pond. And yeah, I think oftentimes when we don't leave the country for a while, uh, we, we sort of look at our own navel a little bit and um, yeah, don't really think about the, the bigger context as much as, as much as we should. Thanks, Max. Uh, now I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Philip Sultrop, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Kia Aerospace, where he leads the technical team to design and operate our stratospheric aircraft. He worked at the German Aerospace Center, otherwise known as DLR, in the unmanned department, and has a PhD in rocket science with a focus on flight mechanics and control. Uh, Philip is also an Edmund Hillary Fellow. Uh, yeah, so Philip, yeah, maybe you can share your experience with the space industry and the aerospace industry and, and how you just describe the potential. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mark, and hi, everyone. Um, I think, yeah, for me, the last five years especially have been quite interesting. I think besides Rocket Lab, um, especially in Canterbury, um, if you've know, seen the aerospace ecosystem growing quite fast and I think if someone had told me five years ago that we would have a one kilometer paved runway at the Tafaki Aerospace Center at Kaituridi Spit, I would have said like, um, that's a great idea, but probably it doesn't really fit the timeline. 
So I think we have a lot of great opportunities and I think we also use those opportunities quite well. At the same time, we are still a small player worldwide uh, and I think often in New Zealand, uh, we are quite quite proud of ourselves. Um, that's probably a good thing, but I think the rest of the world uh, doesn't doesn't think as highly of us as as we do. So I think we still have a very very long way to go. And one thing I think that's quite important is probably of how we represent ourselves to the world um, and the story that we tell. Uh, and that's simply to get more expertise to New Zealand. So experts coming to New Zealand or even you know students coming to New Zealand um, pursuing you know an aerospace career uh, starting you know at Canterbury University at you know Auckland Wellington universities um, they are all like space programs aerospace programs and yeah just give an example um, I myself like more than 10 years ago um, found yeah my view on New Zealand by finding a very very small startup I think they had around 10 people at the time and some, you know, semi-ambitious goals um, to launch, you know, suborbital rockets. And I thought that was, yeah, extremely cool. And um, I, I thought, thought that was, yeah, cool enough to actually then make myself to New Zealand. And that company later became, you know, Rocket Lab as you know it today. So um, pretty much like our biggest aerospace player but when I focused for the first time on New Zealand New Rocket Lab was not what they are today um, they were just yeah again 10 people they hadn't even announced the the electron rocket program but to me that was actually cool enough to pretty much like come to New Zealand and I think even those small story opportunities are very very important and I think we have quite a lot of them. So if you just take that to the next level, I think then um, we're probably, you know, doing quite well overall. Um, yeah, back to you, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Philip. I mean, maybe um, just to sort of further that discussion you started there, I mean, we do need to attract talent uh, to New Zealand. And that, that's quite an interesting story that, you know, you're in Germany, uh, you were doing uh, a bit of aviation and rocketry stuff, but you realized that in the Northern Hemisphere, it was quite limited what you could actually do up there. So you were quite interested to come to New Zealand because you saw the work that Rocket Lab was doing. Um, do you have any other thoughts on you know, what are the things that we need to do as a country to a attract more talented people like yourself from around the world to come and work in the aerospace industry? Um. I mean, first of all, if, if you're talking about professionals, then the visa situation is clearly important. So it's important that there are no hurdles for experts to come to New Zealand. Um, I mean, COVID obviously was a special situation and I think it was unique worldwide. But uh, for example, at Kerospace, we clearly struggled to get experts from overseas. And if we then have to look at um, aerospace experts within New Zealand, um, that's a lot more challenging. So, uh, because there's, there's no history, um, there are normally no, no graduates. Um, from a, let's say, more student perspective, I think it's important to, to highlight programs like, like UC Aerospace, you know. Um, they have attempted um, space shot multiple times. And I mean, they have one, um, you know, rocketry challenges, they've, you know, really shown that they actually were leading on a student level. And I think something like, like that, programs like that, you know, if they get the right funding, if they get the right, you know, advertising worldwide um, through the various channels that we have available, um, then I think that can really attract people from overseas. Right. Thanks, Philip. Uh, so, yeah, I'll just uh, head into a few questions and sort of uh, go put these questions to, to the panelists. So, uh, Emmeline, uh, how could we use uh, sustainability to, to differentiate ourselves in a highly competitive international market? Yeah, yeah, thanks so much uh, for that question. And, and it's interesting because, uh, as you mentioned earlier, what is the definition of sustainability? Because it, it, there's uh, there's so many. 
um, you know, it could be either environmental impact on Earth, environmental impact on space, uh, you know, uh, the benefits on Earth, economic benefits uh, on Earth. Um, I think today it's really important, uh, especially because New Zealand already has this culture of stewardship uh, that is ingrained in, I think, in the culture. Um, and so, I, I and, and also very environmentally conscious that I think those uh, inherent values uh, actually helps shape and could shape the industry here towards like sustainable uh, space practices and and products and services which uh having kind of like looked at the industry over the past uh, few years organically that's already happening i think from the the companies that we're seeing today you know from green propulsion to uh, uh, uh Basically, uh, having uh, you know Leo Labs here with space situational awareness to to companies that are um, trying to tackle space debris, it's already I think ingrained in in the and, and if we can even um, work on those uh, specific niches and 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 markets in a more uh, non organic but a, a more uh, actually um, you know if efficient way, then I think we could be, um, as I mentioned, we could take that brand um, and be the the ideal kind of like country to be doing sustainable space. And, and especially now that we have the um, a new minister of space, which is um, first in the world, actually. Um, and so I think having that kind of like leadership within government uh, will certainly help shape the the industry and potentially like accelerate the growth um in in all of the activities that's happening right thanks emily max over to you what are, what are your thoughts about how new zealand can can really work in that sustainability niche for aerospace oh you're just on mute there max Thanks, Mark. Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, certainly, as Emeline said, it does align with our culture, you know, being a tidy Kiwi. It's something that, uh, you know, we enjoy and that we take pride in. Um, you know, one thing I think is important to understand that, uh, you know, uh, we have to, uh, you know, whatever products we build in aerospace industries, they have to be competitive on the global in the global market. And, you know, these products must meet the demands and the expectations of the clients. And that comes down to performance, first of all. So, you know, we, we can't be really deluded into thinking that if we build something that is uh, green and sustainable, but it doesn't perform well, we'll be able to build a business around it. Like, it's not going to work. And so compliment here to guys from Don Aerospace. Uh, I know that, you know, whenever I'm at conferences and I talk about, uh, you know, uh, their business, I always hear that, you know, great company builds great products. So it's a great example where performance happens to be, you know, a, also a green option. I'm not an expert in that field, but, you know, that's, that's the, what I hear in the industry. Yeah. And uh, another thing that uh, comes to mind when I think about the topic of sustainability is, you know, government support. Like I look at, for example, at Japan, Japan is another nation that is, you know, has a history of uh, taking a lot of pride in sustainability and clean, you know, long term solutions. The Japanese are known for this. And I see Japanese invest, uh, you know, on the government level, a lot of money to startups and the companies that are building sustainable technologies like water based propulsion or you superconducting, you know, manufacturing and so on and so forth. So that's something we could do more in New Zealand, I guess. It's been historically quite difficult for us to get any funding. Mark, you would know there's very little support from the government that is material, really, in New Zealand. It's a good thing and a bad thing. You know, it makes New Zealand companies very strong if they survive. <laughs> but it's quite hard to survive sometimes, you know, for a New Zealand company. Yeah, but yeah, my bottom line is uh, I think sustainability could be a great niche for us. Could be something that we specialize in globally. Uh, but we need to keep in mind that we have to be very competitive with these products. Yeah, th th thanks, Max. That's great. Yeah, I mean, certainly at Key Aerospace, you know, we've we've seen some government initiatives that uh, here in New Zealand have worked quite well. Uh, there was a partnership between the German Aerospace Centre and DLR and MB, and that funded a project. Uh, there's a recent a project with uh, NASA and MB. Uh, so yeah, it's great to see the government is funding some strategic projects. But we'd love to see a lot more of that. Uh, you know, if you look at those other countries around the world, they have billions of dollars of these projects that are going on. Uh, you know, 
obviously New Zealand doesn't have a huge budget, but if we can be strategic and you know every year put out projects that are funded that uh, are supported by the government, you know I think certainly we need government infrastructure investment like in Tafaki. Uh, you know, making sure that we have the infrastructure we need to grow the aerospace industry. We also need investors, you know, national New Zealand investors as well as international investors to kind of fund these projects. And also government procurement. You know, why would we? Why would the government go and use uh, people internationally when we have a lot of that capability that we could nurture uh, locally? And I, you know, I think procurement has has been a big one. It's something I know Dawn Aerospace are, are pretty big on as well. You know, we really need to use. Uh, our own talents you know if we're going to be spending lots of money on certain projects then you know New Zealand companies should be should be looked at for that not just international companies uh Philip over, over to you uh to your thoughts about sustainability and aerospace in New Zealand I think we need to look at what I would call like the big ticket items so when it comes to sustainability there are many many ways of being more sustainable, but the question is, you know, where can you apply something like the the eighty twenty rule? You know, where where can we achieve eighty percent results with like the minimum of input? Um, and to give you an, like like a real example, um, at Care Space we are designing a solar powered um, electric high altitude aircraft. And while it's definitely cool to be involved in in green aerospace and to drive green aerospace technology, you know. Just having a solar powered aircraft being electric, I don't think that that's going to make the big difference. What is hopefully going to make the big difference is the payloads that we would have or the payloads that New Zealand companies could enable. For example, you know, like Max company, you know, having better magnetic systems on board, Dawn Aerospace having better green propulsion systems on board. So if you really look at these payloads and what they can do, then I think that's where we can be really sustainable. So if we can monitor all of New Zealand in various environmental aspects and, you know, we change policy making, um, we change how we actually understand and perceive our environment and we make better decisions. And all of that could, for example, be just simply achieved with a few satellite payloads. I think then, then we are really achieving something and that's when we can really you know, create sustainable outcomes. That said, like, um, you know, while those applications, those, those big applications make the big difference, I think it's too important not to forget, like, the, the subsystems and all of the processes that will support these missions. Yeah, back to you, Mark. Thanks, Thanks Philip. Yeah, I think, you know, if you look at uh, internationally, you know, you, there's different technologies such as nuclear technology, which is quite popular in other countries. But you know, here in New Zealand, obviously, we're nuclear free, doesn't really appeal. You know, and a lot of that, there's a lot of tension around the the military involvement as well. We've seen that at the New Zealand Aerospace Summit. You know, there are some people in New Zealand that are very apprehensive about aerospace because it does have strong ties uh, with the military. So, yeah, I think you know, c companies like Kia and Dawn. You know, we're naturally sort of being pulled over to, to projects that are aligned with New Zealand's values. Uh, and hopefully we can see a lot more of those projects uh, develop. Um, but, you know, as New Zealanders, a lot of us are quite keen to work on solving problems that help the environment, help humanity, uh, help with climate change, uh, mitigation, et cetera. So, you know, hopefully our kind of natural tendencies towards that will, will help us attract more of those projects internationally and, and start start them off uh, here nationally as well. Um, back to you, Emily, and I was just, just wanting to, what, what are your thoughts on some of the obstacles or gaps that we need to overcome? Yeah, I think uh, you you certainly uh, said a lot about like investment and funding um, and for sure, a lot of other countries are, or and especially with governments, like pushing and, and, and having a lot more uh, like funding opportunities that are available to the industry. Today, we have some funding, but they're kind of like integrated with other industries and other technology or, or, or deep tech. It would be great to actually have uh, some funding that are really specific to, to space and aerospace um, that would be uh, good for either 
pre-seed or like uh, idea stage uh, types of um, uh, of uh, endeavors that the government could actually set aside funding for and and that would would definitely i think accelerate what uh what is happening today so there's that part of, of it uh i think um the other part uh, as well as kind of i think related to one of the the questions that i see on the chat with in terms of education uh today education certainly has has started um uh, we're a little bit late in the game because uh, the aerospace engineering and like all of those kind of specifically related to to aerospace and space just started maybe like around three years ago when you know other countries have had this like for decades even if they're not um, they're not spacefaring. Uh, so I think we, we we need to accelerate that, uh, and that's happening now in on the university level. But I think uh, if you even go even further down, there needs to be more STEM uh, like focused um, kind of direction for either primary, middle, and high school uh, because this is a long uh, term. Uh, uh, kind of goal and we may be uh, looking at um, university students that will graduate like within either two to four years and so there's there is a gap between now and then uh, for for those to kind of get up to speed um, uh, to be part of the the industry and so therefore just like what Philip said we need also to attract um, other uh, people uh, into New Zealand which uh, uh, takes me back to the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, which is actually one program that has attracted a bunch of these people um, that uh, that are now kind of like part of the 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 potential kind of like network um, that could help. So, I, for example, I don't know if people know, but uh, like two of the three founders of Planet, which is the biggest constellation of Earth observation satellites uh, on Earth, are Edmund Hillary Fellows. Um, uh, uh, the the three founders of uh, of Ceres Robotics, which is a CLIPS, uh, basically it's a NASA commercial payloads lunar services company, one of only fourteen companies that can actually um, uh, like propose to uh, send NASA to the moon, are Edmund Hillary Fellows, and they're just, those those are just examples. But uh, I think if we can hopefully, I know that the fellowship is, is now not uh, taking any new ones, but um, just hint, hint to government, this is a good uh, program that potentially might be good uh, to uh, still continue um, on further. Um, and uh, and so, I mean, okay, so those are the, the main things. And then the one last thing is, I think there still needs to, um, to have some kind of a, a mind shift in the public where like aerospace and space is actually something that is critical to not just to the future but it's it actually is a part of your daily life today like if if like satellites go down today uh you know power grids energy systems wall street like your your weather uh your the, how you actually navigate everything goes down <laughs> and so uh it's something that touches us uh every day um and i think that mind shift of, of being able to educate people that this is something that is uh, important to you today, important for the future. And it's also economically something that is a big opportunity as I was like uh, talking about like with the $2.3 trillion of opportunity in the future. Great, thanks Emmeline. Uh, so I'll ask two more questions for the panelists and then I'll throw it out to the uh, broader audience and we'll, we'll ask, answer some questions there. Uh, so Max, what is it going to take up to scale to, to what's it going to take to scale up the New Zealand aerospace and space industries in, in a sustainable way? It's a good question, Mark, uh, to scale in a sustainable way. Um, I mean, uh, ultimately, the, the, I think uh, it's going to be it's, uh, it's going to be hard to do without, uh, you know, um, this the the drive behind from the government. Like we must have the support of of the you know of the government behind us to pull it off. And as Emmeline said, I fully agree. Space is uh, is the next big thing. Essentially, we have a number of them in the world currently. I mean, AI is number of, is is one of them. Space is another one. Space economy is going to be massive. It's going to define how we live. And it feels to me like. <clears throat> we are missing out in New Zealand. We have a great opportunity, you know, that Rocket Lab uh, exposed us to, uh, thanks to to you know, to that. But I think uh, we're missing out on the opportunity, and I think we should really 
pay a lot more attention. Uh, we could become the Singapore of space, you know, like Singapore is the financial hub of the world, so to speak. We could become the, uh, the, the sustainable space hub of the world if we do it wisely. And I think it's not too late just yet, but we need to move certainly. Yeah, and in terms of scaling, yeah, uh, you know, without without proper support from the government, all I see, uh, Mark, is uh, you know, companies will probably uh, emerge uh, and likely uh, leave uh, New Zealand either partly or fully. Like what happened to Rocket Lab? You know, we have. I'm not the expert on on, on Rocket Lab, but from my understanding, they have roughly eight to nine hundred staff here in New Zealand, and around a thousand staff in the states. So mostly, it's you know, shifting to the US now. Don Aerospace also, you know, Jewel. Uh, it's uh, Netherlands and New Zealand. Uh, Zeno is feeling the pressure, feeling the pressure, you know, to also have the presence in the States and in Europe as well. And I'm sure you, Mark, uh, at Kia Aerospace, I, in a similar position, it's very hard. It's very hard without the appropriate support to stay and be put. Yeah, yeah well, we started off as Rocket Lab New Zealand and now it's Rocket Lab USA. And that's a that's pretty right. typical story, uh, not just in the aerospace industry and you know, so many other successful companies. You know, New Zealand is a great incubator of talent, but we haven't sort of really worked out that secret key on how we kind of retain uh, the ownership uh, here as much as, as we could. So really, I'd, lo I'd love to see uh, more companies be based here. Uh, but it, it is difficult if you've got way more funding opportunities and way more investment opportunities internationally. You know, when a CEO goes to the board and says, well, we can get this here in New Zealand or we can get this uh, here overseas, it's a, it's a kind of a hard argument. Uh, so, yeah, something that we need to be really cognizant of as a country, we don't want to be just a talent incubator. We actually want to retain that talent and retain that uh, that growth and, and wealth. Uh, so, yes, I think it's something that needs to be more on the radar and it's really not a conversation that you hear very often. Uh, I think as a, as a country, we do really need to address that and, and think about that more. Thanks, Max. So, so Philip, uh, just wanted to ask you, you know, how do we best tell the story about sustainable aerospace capability in New Zealand? Oh, good question. Um, I mean, first of all, I think we have a lot of different channels um, that all have expertise in, in telling stories. Uh, you know, if MB, NZTE, um, you know, even EHF, um, you know, was like, um, it's, yeah, marketing channels, media channels, and also the individual people that pretty much form part of these organizations. And that means we should have already like all the capabilities of creating the stories we just have to um, dig into the examples um, and yeah promote them I mean otherwise uh, we, we we get only like the people that actively search for for what's happening in the world what's happening in New Zealand but if you make it really easy for them to hear about it um, then I think that's a that's a good step Great, thank, thanks, Philip. Uh, so now I'll go to some of the questions that we're seeing in the chat. So feel free to you know keep firing those through. Uh, Emmeline, question for you: um, How can New Zealand play a part in the international regulation of space? Oh, great question! And and, and actually, it's already happening. Um, if you remember, uh, so uh, the New Zealand Space Agency, uh, I I put in my my slides a progressive uh, one because they actually put out really good policy and regulations um, back in 2017 when they when the you know the Space Act uh, in New Zealand started. Uh, it was the very first one to actually create a policy on uh, high altitude. Um, uh, like policies and regulations, which was first in in the world, and so that's like something that um, already uh, could potentially be adopted by by other countries. The New Zealand Space Agency is also part of all of these, um, uh, like you know, UN COPUS, uh, uh, like the 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 uh, UN Office for Outer Space Affairs. So um, they're already uh, part of of the global uh, kind of policy making uh, uh, bodies and are, are already um, putting their weight um, in, in, in all of this and then and could still do more because especially when we're talking about like sustainable space, uh, 
the the policy is lagging behind uh in terms of what needs to what we need to have in terms of regulation especially because commercial is now get, getting ahead of of government activities and so i think the the agency can certainly play a big role in putting out more of those policies that can be adopted kind of like worldwide Right. Thanks, Emily, and thanks to Janine Edge for that question. Uh, had a question uh, about regional clustering for aerospace. You know, is growth and success boosted by geographical proximity to peers? Uh, thank you, Richard Coleman, for that. Maybe I'll jump in on that one. I'm, I'm involved with Aerospace New Zealand, where we're doing a lot of work and building the aerospace industry. Certainly here in Canterbury, we've got a, a cluster of uh, aerospace entities that are working really well together. We're seeing the same thing happen all around the country, Auckland with the Space Institute and Rocket Lab and a whole lot of really cool aerospace. Uh, Auckland up there uh, doing really, really great stuff so that they've got a real space kind of feel uh, here in Canterbury with Tafaki and the university engineering talent. You know, we're more doing a lot of advanced aviation, UAV, drone kind of work. Uh, down in Southland, uh, yeah, you've you've got um, the the space radar, et cetera, that that's happening down down there at uh, Ararua. So Ararua, uh, so yeah, certainly we are seeing different clusters emerge, and you know, if you, even if you look at the the United States, you know, the, all, all the different states contributed in different ways to to the space shuttle. Uh, so everyone had the kind of specialty. Some would work on the boosters, some would work on the fuel tanks, some would work on uh, different aspects of the shuttle. Uh, you know, the same thing could happen in New Zealand. We 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 might have a certain flavour in each of the regions that we're focusing on, and we kind of all work together collectively. Uh, certainly, universities are, are a real powerhouse of generating talent. You know, I know, for example, Dawn Aerospace came down to Canterbury because they saw the engineering talent that was coming out uh, of the university. You know, same with Auckland. You know, we're seeing uh, a lot of people at Auckland going off to to work in the industry. So yeah, I, I believe clustering is really important, uh, and you know the work that Emmeline is doing, Aerospace New Zealand. You know, there's, there's a range of people that are working together to connect uh, people, and you know we have regular meetups. Again, the New Zealand Aerospace Summit, which is coming up in September, that's where a lot of the aerospace industry will get together, and you know we've seen tangible collaborations and projects come out of of those meetups, uh, which I think is just a, a, incredibly important. So yeah, I'm. Um, I'm big on that sort of regional clustering uh, side of things. Uh, if I'll jump on to a next question here uh, from Edward, are there any immediate technical design challenges or R&D challenges that government entities such as Callaghan could tackle to help New Zealand companies, particularly startups, uh, get up and running? I, I, Max, I don't know if you can uh, give your thoughts on that one. Yes, Mark, uh, certainly very br briefly. So Callaghan... Uh, you know, with Zener in particular, we had some Callahan grants uh, and loans in the past, and you know we're currently in the process of acquiring another uh, grant, I believe, with with Callahan. So it is helpful. Uh, yes, it is helpful. Primarily, the help is financial. Uh, you know, we, you know, we don't really draw any help, from, you know, from the from the you know um, technical standpoint there. But yeah, financial help is available, and it has been good. Yeah. A few thoughts on that too, maybe. Yeah. Great. Yeah, first of all, yeah, financial is important, and uh, especially like Callan, unfortunately, has changed. Um, I think especially due to COVID, so a lot of the pre-existing um, grants and scholarships don't exist anymore. Um, and I make that very, very clear right now. If Callahan hadn't given me like a PhD scholarship, I would not be in New Zealand right now. I would have gone back to Germany. Uh, because I had to come here with pretty much no financial support. Uh, I took a big risk and only Callahan kept me here till the end. That's why I stayed in New Zealand. So um, unfortunately, those systems don't exist anymore. I don't know how PhD students, postgraduates get their money from right now, um, unless they take you know big loans. Uh, it's definitely one part so to support that. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to just government entities, I think that it's important that the people, you know, on the ground that actually work on regulations and so on, that they are given pretty much the tools and the freedom to make changes. And I think we should start really separating, you know, 
like when we're talking about the regulator, I think we should actually start talking about the people working for the regulator versus the regulations because they're two different things. And I give you like um, an example that we at Care Space had to, to deal with. In uh, 1944, the Chicago ICAO convention, someone came up with the smart plan that any unmanned or any aircraft flying more than 12 nautical miles um, you know, over the ocean, you need to have certification. Now, anyone in the industry knows that getting certification for an unmanned aircraft is absolutely unrealistic right now. The processes don't exist. So that means that you know a company like Kia Aerospace and potentially Dawn Aerospace can't legally fly unless they get certification. That could take years, maybe a decade, who knows? However, like um, at CIA, for example, they have a team called the Emerging Technologies Team and the people there, they, they tried and tried and they said like, we're working on it and they went to conferences to Canada and they really got the ball rolling. And in the end, they actually found a first solution so that we can now fly. Um, but they had to deal with international rules. And, you know, it's not that they didn't want to. I mean, they tried. It's more like their hands are bound because an international regulation, and the same could apply for a national regulation, says you can't do this. Or it simply says like, yes, let's change this. But the next iteration cycle for this particular act takes three years. You know, in the meantime, feel free to put in some comments on how to change it. But we can't do anything. Our hands are bound. So the people really working for the regulators, from my experience, they are super keen to change things. You know, like, um, I think we are better connected probably with our regulators than in my experience and probably in most other countries. You know, we know the people by first name. We know what they're doing. Um, they're really motivated. They give us calls to say like, hey, we are onto this, but we have to give them the tools. And I think especially you know, ministers and upper management at these regulators, they really need to give the people the freedom and the opportunities to make the change that they want to do. Right. Thanks, Philip. Um, we're sort of running short on time, but maybe just a quick couple of quick uh, fire questions. Um, so there's one from Tim Brown, Emmeline. Uh, how well is our current education offering aligned with what the industry needs? Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think uh, it's it's now getting aligned because it's it's a uh, it, this new uh, courses and uh, degrees uh, are 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 now being offered um, in uh, in university. But at the same time, there's also uh, you know parallel and and uh, other uh, disciplines, for example, like uh, you know remote sensing to data analysis, like um, all of those, uh, like the downstream side of things, um, and then also like mechatronics as well. Uh, all of these uh, different courses that funnel in to either space manufacturing or aerospace manufacturing, they're all there already. Um, so it's just a matter of like connecting the dots and, and also uh, those people who are really interested um, in, the, in the industry, there is already a uh, potential for those on the educational side. But as I mentioned before, I think we need to go even uh, down where uh, you influence, uh, you know, kids minds to actually go into this industry like really earlier on in their uh, in their career and that needs to happen um on like on the primary and middle uh, middle age uh, middle school level great thanks thanks Emily. Uh, one last real quick uh, question uh, mark brigman uh, from Coordinate ventures hi mark uh yeah so max or philip um he's done quite a, a long uh, message there but essentially uh, how do we retain the R&D while the company grows in the target market? Uh, so, yeah, how do we sort of scale up businesses and, and you know, get the, the amount of talent that we need to employ uh, here? If, if we did have a SpaceX size company, you know, how could we achieve that in New Zealand? Uh, Max, Philip, did you have any thoughts on that question from Mark? Philip, what are your thoughts, Philip? Do you want to go first? I'm just looking up the size of SpaceX in the meantime, so I can come up with a comment for Mark. <laughs> We've got about uh, yeah, I think I think step, I think yeah, step number one is make at least the the visa processes really easy. Um, 
for companies like us, timing really, really matters. If it takes three months to 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 bring an expert in, you know, it's like you put a job ad up, takes a month, and then you need to, you know, go through all these like interview processes. And if it then takes another three, four, five months to someone actually finally get in, I mean, that's not really at a pace that we actually operate. So that's definitely, yeah, one big part. And I think for the rest, um, you just yeah simply have to work yeah economically competitive within New Zealand. And as long as we can do that, I think we could eventually build pretty large companies. I think Rocket Lab is it's a good example. I think in their particular case, um, it's largely driven by by politics. So we're talking about you know space politics and and ITAR restrictions, um, where if you don't have you know pretty much like your your link to the US, you just can't really do it. Um, but as long as you don't have these things, I think it it is potentially doable. Thanks, Philip. Any final thoughts from you, Max? Yeah, very quickly. So, yeah, Mark, thank you. Uh, SpaceX at roughly 10,000 staff. Rocket Lab currently in New Zealand at 1,000 employees, approximately 2,000 worldwide. My general rule of thumb normally at Zena, if, if we look at a problem and we are within an order of magnitude short, we can probably pull it off if we try hard enough. You know, that's my rule of thumb. So I'm familiar with that idea that New Zealand could potentially be like a, you know, a place where we originate seeds and let them go, you know, prosper elsewhere in the world. But something in me tells me that we could potentially, you know, if we do it wisely, we could bridge that gap, you know, the order of magnitude gap and actually become a country that hosts, uh, uh, you know, um, these uh, these future aerospace owners and, uh, and giants. Right. I mean, the big question would even be, do we even need or want companies at the size of 10,000 people? I mean, generally, you could consider that a, a pretty great success. And I think the numbers for SpaceX in many ways speak for themselves. But is that actually even our strengths? I think New Zealand could even enable many, many more smaller aerospace start, um, startups. So let's let's say 50 to 1,000 and, and really split that up. Right. Thanks, Philip. So, Mark, I see you got your hand up there, but um, I think Kelly's going to get grumpy at me if I keep going uh, too much longer. Um, but feel free to um, send me an email or uh, give us a call. Uh, but uh, yeah, but basically, you know, really great session. Really enjoyed the answers and the questions uh, that we got. Um, back over to you, Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I'm not grumpy at all. This has been a great session. So I just wanted to say thank you so much to Mark and Emily and Max and Philip for sharing your time and your knowledge uh, with us. So we're all uh, extremely grateful. Um, and thanks to everyone on the call for joining this session. Um, but I will close this with a karakia. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa ponamu te moana. Hei hui arahi, ma tato e te rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai, tato e a tato katoa. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed the session um, and we'll see you again real soon. Matiwa.